The price of Bitcoin falling is a distraction. This is where true hodlers learn and find and build their strength. At the same time, there's a lot of uncertainty with the cryptocurrency markets. We see some major moves happening in the world of financial regulation, Bitcoin regulation, and politics. Let's discuss. Hey everybody, I'm Gary Palmer Jr., you're you, and together we are Minting Coins, your trusted source for crypto news, interviews, and ICO reviews. Thanks for showing up. Hit that like button. It really supports us and it helps other people find this content. Also, if you have any questions or comments, leave those in the comments box below so your voice is heard as part of the community. In today's episode, we're talking about Bitcoin, the price of Bitcoin falling, and what's happening in the meantime in the world of politics and regulation and the path of Bitcoin's price going potentially even higher than where we saw it this past December. We still have these predictions from John McAfee, where they say that the price of Bitcoin will hit over $1 million in less than three years. And according to the trajectory, according to the math, we are still well on target to reach those numbers. In the meantime, you know, weak hands are folding, weak hands are selling, weak hands are wondering why are they in Bitcoin or why weren't they in Bitcoin because of all these additional alternative currencies, which are taking a bigger hit than even Bitcoin is taking. And remember, when you're looking at those, uh, those trades and those profits, make sure you're understanding the difference between the capital gains that, or losses that you may be realizing by making those trades, but also realize how much Bitcoin may be lost and the percentage of Bitcoin uh, that your trades are down versus you know, how much down they are in USD, right? Because what it comes down to is that more and more US dollars are being printed, more and more dollars are being used to try to control the different systems around the world. And every time more of these dollars are being printed, it makes all those dollars worth less. It makes everything else cost more money, including making Bitcoin cost more money. But on the other hand, when we look at Bitcoin, there's never going to be more than 21 million. There's only about 16.8 million of these right now. And uh, with that, we are expecting this to put a lot of pressure on Bitcoin and the price of Bitcoin to go literally through the roof. So with that being said, let's take a quick peek at the market. Let's take a look around and let's discuss. Okay, so real quick, taking a peek at the market at livecoinwatch.com, we see that the price of Bitcoin is about $8,200, about $8,300. As we said before, there's only about uh, 17 million, 16.9, 17 million of these Bitcoins circulating. So as the price of Bitcoin has been going down from above 10,000 to 10,000 to nine to eight, at the same time, we are noticing the Bitcoin dominance increasing. So some people are seeing a fall in Bitcoin but the dominance, the percentage of the overall market cap in Bitcoin is increasing. Why is that? That's because people are selling the altcoins at a greater rate. Look at this, negative 28% for the week, negative 26% for the week. Monero even, negative 31% for the week. And, you know, they had that hard fork going on. Uh, Tron and IOTA down 20.5 and, you know, 25% for the week. Bitcoin is down at a smaller percentage than all of those, only 16%. So uh, comparatively, Litecoin has done phenomenally well as Bitcoin has been decreasing because although Litecoin is down almost 10 percent, it's down less than Bitcoin is down over the past seven days. So these are the high numbers that we're looking at. And we're recognizing that at some point this Christmas sale is going to end. At some point, there's going to be no more product left on the shelf. And when that some point happens and, and people's appetite to spend money starts to kick in, as people's fear of missing out starts to kick in, as we see a rush and a flood come into the cryptocurrency space, if in fact that ends up being what happens as we're predicting, then uh, we can see these prices increase very, very quickly, over 10000 to fifteen. And uh, we think it's possible that we can easily see a Bitcoin price by the end of the year between twenty-five and fifty thousand dollars. So 
turning to some of the news, some of the headlines, at the same time that the cryptocurrency market is crashing, at the same time, a lot of people in the cryptocurrency industry are really focused on what's happening in the cryptocurrency space and the blockchain space. We see some major developments and changes that are happening at a high political level involving the traditional financial system. So what's happening is that the Senate is voting to roll back parts of the Dodd-Frank banking law and according to a lot of people who are concerned about the power that this gives the traditional banking industry, uh, they are saying that this banking bill is going to put the United States at risk for another 2008 financial crash. And this is because the progressives are saying that the legislation threatens to undo important rules protecting us from these different risks. And this bill would release more than two dozen regional banks from stricter oversight by the Fed, making it easier for Wall Street banks to fight off existing regulations. And buried down in the details is a system that would give uh, stadium-style banks, banks that are big enough to put their names on sports stadiums, would have huge amounts of power to put people's money at risk, to, to allow them to leverage and make financial bets that aren't secure. And uh, this would set us up for the same risky behavior that we were in in 2008. The difference is that, that at that time, that behavior was happening when we didn't have Bitcoin, when we didn't have blockchain technology. And if this new 2008-style catastrophe ends up hitting us again, as Bill Gates said in yesterday's video, will be a certainty that this will happen. It's going to be interesting to see how people rush into gold, rush into silver, but more importantly, how they rush into Bitcoin specifically and the other different cryptocurrencies, which have the deflationary aspects as opposed to the inflationary. So it's not just the risks of people putting their money into Bitcoin to protect their money and by doing so, putting the banks in the worst position, you know, forcing the banks to hold on to the dollars that they also don't want. The government and this one senator let it slip in his speech that Bitcoin is hurting the government control of the U.S. dollar. And so the United States and the senator is mentioning how the U.S. dollar is used by the United States to control other governments, to control other countries, to impose sanctions, to control people's actions and their speech, let it be for better or for worse, and Bitcoin may be reducing their power to do so. So let's take a, a quick listen at, at what he has to say. Our ability to have the dollar be the chief means of international finance is what has underpinned our ability to impose sanctions and, uh, and stop tax cheating. So the U.S. dollars being the main financial instrument of world commerce is what has allowed the United States to impose sanctions and to exert control over the world. That's not just interesting for the people within inside the United States of America, but that's very interesting for other countries around the world to hear it so explicitly said by a U.S. senator. And uh, this really doesn't do a lot of service for the U.S. dollar, and it's really emphasizes some of the strengths and some of the reasons why we feel that Bitcoin and blockchain technology is going to grow very quickly, how it's going to increase in power, how the cat is out of the bag, so to speak. And so across the world, we see more governments that are accepting of the blockchain technology. We see more governments that are accepting of the decentralized Bitcoin and Ethereum tokens, uh, Monero, Dash, all these different tokens because they want to tax it. They want to regulate it. Thailand is beginning their legal process to regulate and tax cryptocurrency. We see nations around the world who are interested in creating their own fiat-based cryptocurrencies and allowing their own fiat money to be faster and more efficient than the old way of making money and transmitting money. And this way, their fiat money, whoever, whichever countries do this, will be competitive with digital currency, interchangeable with digital currency, allowing these governments, these countries, to receive the taxes to allow their systems to function. Because if they don't create these systems, then people will regardless move into the cryptocurrency realm and uh, the same thing will happen except the governments won't receive the tax revenues. And so money is ruling the world. Money is a big aspect of how governments and large corporations are making their decisions. 
And because of that, their decision-making process will move to a place that is inclusive of decentralized cryptocurrencies and not just blockchain technology. But with that being said, it's also going to be interesting to see the United States response to cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin. As uh, the senator points out in the, in the previous article, this really threatens the power control, the structure and dynamics of the old world order. And so we have regulations happening not just around the world, but also right back where it all started in the good old New York State. Now in New York State, we have the bit license, but we have a legislator who's proposing an alternative means to the bit license, a means where essentially without getting into the details of this article, blockchain companies will choose to be audited, have a certain set of rules to uh, reduce risk for the people who they're going to be serving within New York State. And then by choosing to have these audits to protect the assets and to protect the people and the processes of the infrastructure of these blockchain companies in New York State, it will allow them to move down that road using that route of operation inside New York and allow them to not have to go down the, the pay to play route, the this paying this these huge fees and these huge lawyer costs, which are restricting a lot of companies from operating in New York State. Because of that, New York State is losing jobs, it's losing taxes, it's losing revenue, it's losing brain power, it's losing manpower, it's losing money. And uh, they're probably recognizing that, you know, we're seeing the news coming out of Wyoming, Arizona, uh, different states in the United States, different, you know, states around the world. They are, you know, accepting of what's happening. They are creating rules welcoming this industry. And because of that, they are receiving an influx of brain power, an influx of manpower, and also creating new revenues where they can then use that money to pay their salaries and, uh, and, and maybe some roads and some bridges too. I am not sure what ultimately this would mean for New York State. Could the audits and could the other requirements be more of a hindrance than the, this paying this huge fee? It's uh, hard to say, right? The huge fee is definitely a hindrance, but they're just replacing one type of regulation with another type of regulation. And it'll be interesting you know, to see when the businesses really dive in to understand how this would work out. And even if this gets passed in New York State, ultimately the goal may be to get more business. And because we are in New York State, we definitely hope that whatever happens, it reduces the regulation to allow more businesses to participate in New York State for New York State citizens. Because let's all not forget the prediction by John McAfee, who said that the price of Bitcoin will hit $1 million by 2020. Specifically, I think it's by uh, March or May of 2020. He originally said it was going to be $500,000, but then later revised it, claiming it was going to be $1 million. And we're going to get a little more into this into a second. It's also interesting to note that originally he said he was talking about Bitcoin Cash, but later retracted to say he was actually talking about Bitcoin. Nevertheless, here's the tweet where he revised his prediction when he predicted the $500,000 at the end of 2020 that he used a model that used a $5,000 Bitcoin price by the end of 2017. And so because the price accelerated, I guess he doubled the 5,000 to 10,000, even though we hit $20,000 by the end of December. And then he said instead of $500,000, it was going to be $1 million by the end of 2020. And this would put us just about two years away. And so in just about two years, if the price of Bitcoin is not over $1 million, then John McAfee is going to eat his dick if he is wrong. And so real quick, why did John McAfee pick the year 2020? It's because in August 2020, that's when the next Bitcoin halving happens. And so the last Bitcoin halving was in 2016, about a year and a half ago. And every new Bitcoin that was created every 10 minutes was 25 Bitcoin every 10 minutes. Then August 2016, that got cut in half to 12 and a half. It's where we are today. And so in two and a half years, in August 2020, somewhere around that time, what's going to happen is that the halving is going to happen again. And so instead of uh, 12 and a half Bitcoin being created about every 10 minutes, there's going to be only six and a quarter new Bitcoin created every 10 minutes. So in 2016, moving into 2017, what we saw was a lot of pressure on the Bitcoin price. And uh, the supply of new Bitcoin got cut in half, was getting cut in half. We saw the price of Bitcoin go from 400 to 600 to 800, back down to 500. Then we see it shoot up to $1,000 by the end of the year. And a year later, you know, it was between 10 and $20,000. And so John McAfee is predicting that the same thing is going to happen because when the supply gets decreased and if the demand stays the same or 
or if the demand increases, then that's going to put a huge amount of pressure on the price of Bitcoin. And so John McAfee thinks that pressure is going to be so great that it's going to push the price of Bitcoin in just two and a half years from now, less than two and a half years from now, up to one million dollars. And so right here we have this really fun graph. This is the Bitcoin price prediction tracker based on what John McAfee said. There's the math in this prediction tracker. You can check that out. You can see what that's all about. You can see where we are versus uh, where we were when he originally made this prediction. And then you can take this little slider and you can move this slider out. So if you notice in here, if we move this uh, down from when he made the prediction, we are consistently staying with inside the prediction. And so over here, this $20,000 mark was way, way high. We reached this uh, low not too long ago in September 2017. And then again on February 5th, well, we can see that the red line is showing us the price of Bitcoin predicted logarithmically by John McAfee. We see the price moving up to hit that $1 million when we zoom all the way out. And if you guys are watching this on the video and not just listening to this on the podcast, you can't even see the majority of the Bitcoin price over time once we hit this million dollar mark. It really looks like the, the very beginning of the long tail. There's a little bit of a blip up there when it hit the $20,000 mark, but it really dwarfs where we are now. So it just goes to say that it is a outrageous prediction to say that we are going to reach $1 million. Yet this is the world that we're living in. This is the matter of the fact. When we zoom out and we look at the total history of the Bitcoin price starting in January 2011, two years after Bitcoin was created, we, if we sort of uh, create this red line from the very beginning, we can see that this red line is very close to being on the same sort of uh, beginning track as well, logarithmically increasing from zero to $1 million dollars. Over these short nine years of the market history, over these short 11 years of Bitcoin's total lifespan. So this tracker is really fun. I definitely recommend you come over here and play with this. And uh, as time goes on, we'll see if this sort of matches up with uh, John McAfee's prediction. So far, so good. But what could be the catalyst that can cause Bitcoin to spike so quickly and so rapidly even before we reach the next halving? Well, what we think that is going to be is going to be the Lightning Network. The Lightning Network is really moving along well. The number of nodes are increasing. More and more people are being encouraged encouraged to open up payment channels. These lightning network nodes are being sort of described as opening up a bar tab. You uh, go to the bar, you open up a tab, and then at the end of the night, you reconcile the tab and all of that happens on the actual blockchain. But opening up the tab and, um, you know, having all of these uh, off-chain transactions happen, you know, off-chain on these nodes, and then they get reconciled onto the main chain, therefore reducing the fees, increasing the privacy, and also dramatically increasing the number of transactions that can happen per second. All of the benefits that are really missing from a Bitcoin that can be used uh, in, in a mass scale and, and as a means for cash. And all of these variables, are, all of these attributes are what Lightning Network is going to be bringing to the system. So we are seeing all of this progress. We are seeing all of this growth. We are seeing a lot of testing and development from some of the greatest minds in the blockchain industry and the blockchain space who are really focused on creating a product, not just creating an ICO, not just getting rich. A lot of these guys are already rich. And what they're fighting for is an open source public utility that has as the most decentralization possible first and foremost. And then after having the most decentralization possible, the most freedom possible, then they're worrying about these other attributes, which you know are going to make it cheaper and faster and stronger. That's where we are at right now. That is where the Lightning Network is right now in terms of the, the testing phase on the main net. And here's an example of how we see this progressing. We have this Japanese utility company that's testing the Lightning Network. And uh, we know people in Japan, companies in Japan are very pro Bitcoin, very pro blockchain mining, very pro cryptocurrency. All uh, people and companies and merchants in Japan are allowed and able to accept cryptocurrencies, virtual currencies. They, it comes like second nature because they're a strong digital society. And so this Chuba 
Electric Power Company, Japan's third largest provider of electricity, is interested in real-time payments that are needed because、uh, all of these Internet of Technology devices are going to require electricity, and the payments need to be real-time in order to gauge the usage and collect payments on the usage to make all of this technology both efficient and possible. And what the project managers, developers, and engineers are recognizing is that Lightning makes it possible to operate a highly reliable charge management system with a small introduction cost. And they're going to continue to develop an experiment to see what kind of architecture is going to be best to apply for the Lightning network for the Internet of Things for this major power company in Japan. And with all the other power companies around the world, they are probably paying attention. They are probably looking at this. They are recognizing. The incredible benefits that this would provide their companies, and they probably don't want to be too far behind, too late to the game to have all of their competitors to make use not just of blockchain technology, but also the Bitcoin blockchain, the Bitcoin token, the Bitcoin Lightning Network, and all the capabilities that this is going to be providing to the world. Now, I think it goes without saying when we go to CoinMarketCap or LiveCoinWatch.com and we are scrolling through the different blockchain projects that are out there,、uh, when we're discovering new projects out there, let it be projects like Omizi Go or projects like Zencash, projects like the Waves platform, we want to recognize that these. Projects that are providing services that are new and different, that are building their own utility, that are focused on making、uh, real applications that have real need, that solve real problems for the masses, for real people around the world, and not just corporations. Platforms that solve the need for both people and corporations. These are going to be the platforms and projects that have huge levels of success. Now, personally, I think that we live in a world where there's room for more than just one blockchain project. I think Bitcoin is going to be big. I think Bitcoin is going places. I also think Ethereum is going to be big, and I think Ethereum is also going to be going places. I think that Ethereum and Bitcoin sort of have. Two different applications. They have、uh, two different purposes. And when we see what's happening with Ethereum and Plasma, and how Omizigo is providing, you know, their open source white label SDK for any corporation in the world to create their own wallet, then that creates its own ecosystem, its own scaling with its own platform that serves the need of these smart contracts, of the execution of that code. Because while Bitcoin could do that, Ethereum just has a competitive advantage as a first mover advantage, and they do have a lot of great minds working on those projects. So I don't think we can dismiss what、uh, you know really good projects that are solving real problems with strong developers. You know what they are doing, what they are bringing to the table. We have the same sort of scenarios with Monero, with Zencash. With、uh, projects like Particle, which are creating these privacy-based blockchains where people can transmit value、uh, with each other, where they can transmit messages with each other. With Zencash, we see Zencash has created this secure node network that allows their private blockchain traffic to look. Just like normal encrypted internet communications, you know that's not something that Bitcoin or Ethereum or Monero is doing yet, and that can provide a huge benefit to a lot of people around the world that live in countries and they want to hide, you know, the fact that they're using blockchain technology or that they're, you know, sending or receiving Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. They can use Zencash to obfuscate their. Financial transactions. They can use Zencash to obfuscate their、uh, personal communications, and they can also use Zencash for other really cool features like、um, publishing and、uh, sharing of you know other types of information. But ultimately, more importantly than fighting about which crypto project is more interesting or which crypto project is the best crypto project, I think it's really important that these different projects come together, these different teams and developers and people around the world come together to recognize what's happening at the. 
top highest levels of governments and regulators, uh, what they are doing and saying about the laws with the traditional financial systems, making it easier for them to manipulate currency and manipulate the markets while creating more regulations around blockchain technology because of the loss of control that's going to give their fiat currencies. These are their words at this point. This is what they are saying at this point. And it's really interesting to see the two sides continue to debate, to see the two sides continue to take action. It'll be interesting to see where this goes as we get closer to the middle of the year and as 2008 continues to progress. So with that, I'd love to know, what do you think? What do you think about the Dodd-Frank banking regulations? Do you think we should uh, you know, remove those? Do you think we should make those stricter? Or what do you think about the John McAfee prediction bet? Do you think we're going to hit $1 million by 2020? Do you think it's going to happen a little bit before or maybe a little bit after? And uh, what else do you think about some of the other topics that we talked about the show and the regulation happening both within the United States and New York State? Are you interested in that? Is that something that you think is going to happen? You know, do you think Bitcoin and cryptocurrency is going to get easier in, in New York to open up a business? Or do you think it's going to be just as difficult if, uh, you know, they it pass whatever new regulation that they want to do? Let me know what you think in the comments box below. Again, tap that like button. It's uh, really awesome, uh, really supportive. We really appreciate that. Subscribe if you haven't already. And until next time, I'm glad that together we are minting coins.